Homeschooling, home education in general, has become a lot more mainstream, especially within the libertarian movement. And we heard this morning from Mike Munger about what he said, permissionless innovation, right? Who are going to be the permissionless innovators? Is it going to be the people who, for 12 years, have been told you have to ask permission for everything? You've been conditioned through the school system to ask permission to go to the toilet, right? But more importantly than that, what am I supposed to be learning? Well, it's nine o'clock, you're supposed to be learning mathematics. A bell rings, it's 9.40, you're not supposed to be learning mathematics anymore. You're supposed to be learning geography. And you're conditioned to be told what to learn and what to think and how to think and everything is about asking permission. And it's hard, even though some people have done so, uh, to break out of that. Ten years ago or, or more, we used to celebrate the, the, you know, the college dropout, like Bill Gates. But today we're seeing people come through who've never dropped in. You know, there are people like Palmer Lucky, who started Oculus Rift, a homeschool kid, um, just tinkering around at home. Um, sold that to um, Facebook for in the billions before he was 21. Never dropped in to school or, or anything else. There are people like Jessica Watson, first um, female to circumnavigate the world, or the youngest, youngest person to circumnavigate the world in a solo yacht at age 15, right? A homeschool kid. Things like that you just can't do when your routine is dictated to you all the time. Um, but we're gonna hear from some people like um, Avens, who herself, Avens, sorry. And she dances, she doesn't dance. <laughs> who herself, um, home educated and uh, started college at age 14. And we're gonna hear from Tofa or Chris, who um, himself was home educated and who um, became an award-winning short filmmaker and an entrepreneur um, without ever going into so-called the system. And we're gonna hear from Brad, who has been through uh, the Praxis program, which basically says, don't go to college, just start creating, just start doing. I'm not going to give long introductions because these guys are going to share a little bit of their own story themselves. Um, and then I'm going to come back and talk just a little bit about what's happening in the university higher education and career space right now. But we'll start with um, Chris, and Chris can introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his background. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you to Mark and thank you for everyone who made the time to come. I really wasn't sure how full this room was going to be, how many people are actually going to want to hear about homeschooling and, uh, and thankfully there's a few of you, so thank you for that. I want to start this, uh, this session by doing the impossible. I'm going to make a statement that I actually think an entire room full of libertarians will all agree with. Now this is an impossible endeavour as anyone who's been in the libertarian movement will know, but I'm going to try. Here's the statement. The purpose of raising children is to prepare them for adulthood. Can anyone disagree? Anyone want to raise a hand and say that the purpose for, in, in raising children is not to prepare them for adulthood? Mark today in your diaries, ladies and gentlemen, a room full of libertarians agreed on a statement. Okay, so this is the purpose for which we're raising children. Whether you're homeschooling or using a systemized form of schooling, outside of schooling, just the raising of children the purpose is to prepare them for adulthood. The problem, and where I'm sure there would be a lot of disagreement, is what does prepared actually mean? At what point do we say you are now prepared to be an adult? For that matter, what is an adult? I am not going to attempt to answer any of these questions because we would probably devolve into a fist fight if we had so many disagreements on what that actually looks like. But I want to talk about prisons, a logical connection. I'm sure you can all see exactly where I'm going. If you can, please let me know, because I'm not entirely sure. <clears throat> Take someone who's been in prison for 10 years. When they get released, they're given a halfway house. They're given a place where they can go that isn't prison, but isn't quite the real world yet, where there's some people who can kind of help them find their feet and get back into the real world. Because after 10 years of being told exactly what to do and how to live, they have become institutionalized. They don't know how to function in the real world anymore. Okay. Take a child, and at 18 months of age, put them into preschool. 
then into primary school, then into high school, and then they go straight into university. And at 23 years of age, they come out very well educated and completely 100% institutionalized. I would argue if the goal of raising children is to prepare them for adulthood, or may I say it a different way, to prepare them for the real world, institutions are at an automatic disadvantage. I'm not saying it's impossible, but preparing someone for the real world inside an institution is like trying to box with one arm tied behind your back. You are at a huge disadvantage. The real world is the best place to prepare people for the real world. So, I think being prepared means three things. I think all we have to do is help children achieve competence in three areas for them to actually be able to succeed as adults. Those three are this. I think they need to be good with words. I think they need to be good with numbers. And I think they need to be good with other people. And I think anyone who reaches adulthood and has a decent level of competence in all three of those things is going to find their way through the world pretty well. It's not going to be too hard for them to find a place where they belong. But let's just take those three measurements, words, numbers, and social competence, let's call it. In the privacy of your own mind, answer for yourself how well do you think that systemized education is doing at creating young people, young adults, adults eventually, who are competent in all three of those areas? I'm not going to give you my answer, but in the privacy of your own mind, give yours. I want to give you some anecdotes, some things that happened to me and things that I did as a homeschooler that would not have been possible had I been in an institutionalized learning environment. And I want you, as you listen to these anecdotes, to think about what I was learning about words, about numbers, about relationships with people, sometimes business relationships, sometimes personal relationships, and ask yourself whether maybe this completely, maybe seemingly directionless form of learning was maybe more effective than any institutionalized learning would be. The year was 1994 and I was 12 years old. I fancied myself as something of an inventor and I had just had the idea that was going to change the world. You see, I'd been reading in a little physics textbook all about how the retention of momentum in wheels was affected by where the center of gravity was relative to the hub and the rim. Okay? If you take a given weight of wheel and you put all the weight on the rim, it will continue to spin for longer than if you put all the weight near the hub. I thought, oh, that's fascinating. So if I'm riding my bicycle, because my bicycle was the most important thing in the world to me at 12 years of age, and I could have all the weight in the wheel near the hub, then it'll be easy for me to accelerate and speed up. But then if I could somehow get the weight near the rim, then that would actually help me to be able to power up hills and keep my momentum if I could just sort of shift where the weight was. So I went to that great uh, tool of designers and architects throughout the ages, Microsoft Paint, <laughs> and I clicked little black pixels onto a white document and I drew out a schematic of what this might look like. Really thick spoked wheels with weights on the inside that had springs and as the centrifugal force built up they'd move towards the rim and you would end up with this perfect world. At slow speeds the weight is near the, the axle, as you speed up it moves out towards the rim. Bonza, this is it, I'm going to change the world. I kid you not, I printed that out and I faxed it to the Australian Institute of Sport <laughs> at 12 years of age. Sincerely believing because my phone number was down the bottom of that document that I was going to get a phone call from a very excited person who was going to tell me that we were going to keep on winning golds in cycling from now until forevermore because of this amazing invention. It's been 23 years and I'm, I'm starting to lose hope. <laughs> I don't think that phone call's coming. Somehow they don't want to add six kilograms worth of weight to the wheels of their bicycles, who knew? So nothing came out of that exercise. But think about what that exercise involved me doing and compare that back to the idea of words, numbers and people and think about the lessons that I learned. Two years later, I was delivering newspapers for, uh, for the leader newspaper group, little local newspapers. I'd fold them up and put them in people's letterboxes, which was all good. The problem was there were some much cooler paper delivery boys than me that delivered some of the other papers and they were wrapped in plastic and they got to throw them. That was cool. Folding them, putting them in letterbox, not so much. So I wanted to find a way to be able to throw my newspapers just like the cool kids. So I thought about it, I thought, why aren't leader newspapers wrapping their, their newspapers in them? I thought, well, it's probably an extra cost, right? It's like a ex whole extra process, there's materials involved, the time involved, the machines. So if I'm going to convince them 
to let me wrap and throw their newspapers into people's front yard so I can be one of the cool delivery boys. I'm going to have to find a way for them to make a profit doing it. Can you see the little capitalist in me coming through at 14 years of age? So I thought about it, I thought, what if they printed advertising on that plastic wrap? And you can say to, to companies, the very first impression that will get made when someone goes outside and picks up the newspaper is going to be your brand. You get the very first say. Not a bad plan. So I rang companies that manufactured the plastic bags and the plastic wrap, and I found out how much it was going to cost to buy. I found out how much it was going to cost to print on, and I found out how much it was going to cost to ship and supply out to the people who were delivering the newspapers so that when we got the newspapers, we could fold them up and put them in the plastic sleeves with printing on them. I did the whole business model. You know what I did then? I printed it all out. I was smarter this time. I didn't fax it to some anonymous person. I used the phone book. Google was, you know, sort of around, but not. I used the phone book. And I looked up the address of where I needed to send it, and I put it in a real envelope, and I posted it. And I waited for the phone to ring. And it did. They rang me up. They were very impressed with the whole proposal, and they were very, very kind to me and invited me around. And I toured the whole facility, and they showed me a bunch of stuff about how printing works in the press and everything else, uh, and told me very kindly and politely that they were never, ever going to start wrapping their newspapers, no matter what the economic model might look like. But think about the lessons that I learned in that process. And now the opportunity to actually have stood there and talked to some senior people in this organisation at 14 years of age and have conversations with them that they would never have had with a 14-year-old kid on the street. Then finally, I was fast forward about another two years, 16 years of age. I was doing industrial cleaning at the time. I started working full time when I was 14. That's another story. I was doing industrial cleaning at the time. I got a phone call from one of my contacts who said, hey, there's a factory near you that wants their ceiling replaced over the Easter long weekend, which is a week and a half away. I don't have time to make that happen. Can you make it happen? Whatever money you make out of the deal, just take it. I don't know anything about ceilings. I'd never heard of this company before, but I said, okay, sure, I'll give it a go. So I got on my push bike. It was a mountain bike by then, not the BMX I had when I was 12. So I'd, I'd upgraded and put on a suit what little suit I had, and I rode down to this company, parked the bike around the corner, locked it against a chain link fence with my helmet, made sure my hair wasn't like helmet hair, wasn't too bad, and I walked in. And I said, hey, I've just been called by Paul, he sent me in to, to sort out this ceiling for you. Can I have a look at it? And I said, sure, come on through, have a look at the ceiling. Had a look at the ceiling, it definitely needed replacing. I don't know the first thing about replacing ceiling, but I could tell that one needed to be replaced. <laughs> so... I went back home, bicycle, made sure I didn't ride past the factory. I, I rode a different way so they wouldn't see me on the bicycle. And I opened up the telephone book and I started ringing contractors and plasterers. Incredibly, and as an adult now, this, this baffles me. I don't know how this happened. I successfully got three different tradespeople to show up and quote on the job. How does that happen? I can't even get that to happen as a 35-year-old, but as a 16-year-old, I managed. I put two of the quotes to the client with a recommendation that they take a particular one. They agreed. They came in, they did the job over the Easter long weekend. The client were happy, they paid me. I paid the subcontractor and I stood there at the door of my house as the subcontractor walked away. I paid him in cash, I didn't know why he wanted cash, but I figured that's easy for me. I can just give him cash. <laughs> and I stood there with $200 in my hand, left over. Happy customer, happy contractor, happy me. And I learned more about life in that moment, standing behind the front door of my house after it closed than I think I could have been taught by any lecturer in any classroom in the world. That, for me, is the beauty of homeschooling. I think the difference between a good education and a not so good education is the size of the world that you see as you are brought into adulthood, as you are prepared for adult life. Being educated inside an institution too often is like being pent up in that prison and peeking over the walls to get glimpses of the outside world as they take you on an excursion or you do a, work, a week of work experience or these various little activities that they organise for you. You're learning about the world as a theoretical exercise from the outside. Someone just leaned on the button. Thank you. We're in homeschooling if it's done right, and it can be done wrong, that's another conversation, but if it's done right, homeschooling opens up this amazing world where you learn about the world and you prepare for adulthood by living in the world and engaging with the adults that inhabit it. I'm very, very grateful for having been homeschooled and I invite any questions that anyone may have after this session or even later on, just stop me and, and ask any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I'll just introduce Arvins. Arvins O'Brien's is a second O'Brien. Sorry, I almost put a plural on your name. Because there's an S at the end of it. 
Second generation libertarian activist, the product of unschooling, peaceful parenting, and started university at 14 years old. Her work within the libertarian movement includes being the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire from 2006 to 08, working for Peter Schiff's investment firm, and multiple presidential campaigns, including Ron Paul's 2008 campaign. She contributes to the Libertarian Republic, where most of her, where her most viral article was 12 Reasons You Can't Get a Liberty Lady. She is a chapter leader of the Ladies of Liberty Alliance and is probably best known as a Facebook agitator who never blocks anyone. Thank you, Arvins. I really like that intro with the never blocks anyone. It's true. Um, so, wow, I loved the way that you just described the benefits of homeschooling. I'm mostly just going to talk about the anecdotes of Ah, anecdotal conversation about growing up as a uh, homeschooler and then unschooler in the US. Um, my parents were libertarian activists who decided that they didn't trust the government to educate their children, and they weren't entirely sure they trusted private educational models to educate their kids. My mother is a college professor who worked on her doctorate, so she's a very academic person. My father has a teaching certificate. And they homeschooled my brothers in the 70s and 80s. They homeschooled me in the 80s and 90s um, into the 2000s, I guess. Um, and homeschooling was an interesting experience in the US. In the US, um, when I was growing up, most people saw homeschoolers as like crazy religious freaks that didn't want their children to learn about evolution. And, um, and so there was definitely a subset of that. But there was another uh, interesting kind of leftist side of homeschooling in the US is that my parents also happened to be pagan. And uh, there was a whole contingent of pagan homeschoolers. And so I knew a lot of leftist homeschoolers. And it wasn't just a right wing thing. There were definitely like, little subsets within, within the groups. My parents, of course, as libertarians, had a lot of other libertarian homeschoolers around, and we often would do kind of social events together and like in little homeschooling group interactions. But li but growing up homeschooling was interesting, and growing up as a peaceful in peaceful parenting was interesting because my mother loved to make everything into a lesson. Like it wasn't you know uh, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. You learn things. It's it's all day long. You you have opportunities to learn about how to cook and what, you know, and, and science and, and different things. I remember when I asked my mother if I could have a pet, we went back and forth about dogs and cats and I really liked birds. And so mom was like, well, you need to learn all about how to take care of a bird and then you can have one. And so I got to educate myself about the care and keeping of birds. And by eight years old, I decided I really wanted to make like a presentation just like I'd seen in like videos of, of kids in schools. I wanted to make like a science fair project presentation. So I studied all about aerodynamics and how birds' wings work and provide lift and, and all that. And I was just eight years old, like, oh, I need to tell everyone about this. And, and it was fun because I was excited about education. And at the end of it, my mother let me get another bird. So, <laughs> so I have a lot of birds, in case you were curious. Or if you've followed me on Facebook, you definitely have seen them. Um, but that's, that's what life was like. My, I didn't have a particular schedule. I didn't have to learn things in any particular order. And every once in a while, my mother would have some work project she needed to do. And she'd say, hey, this week I'd like you to stay with a friend of mine. And they're going to teach you things that are interesting. Ask them about what they do, what their career is. I spent like three days with my mother's friend learning how to play pool and how it related to geometry. Uh, another one of my mother's friends was uh, studying with Noam Chomsky, so I got to sit in on one of his lectures. And my mother being a college professor meant I had these random opportunities to just sit in on her classes. Because she'd say, hey, do you want to stay home or do you want to come into class with me? And I would sit in the back of her classroom and I'd take notes. I'd be like, this is really interesting. Wow. And, uh, and sometimes she'd be passing around a midterm. And I would take, uh, I'd actually do like the midterm. And she'd grade it. And she'd be like, just so you guys know, my 10-year-old got a 90. And some of you got below my 10-year-old score. So I, I, thought, I thought of like sitting in classrooms and, and taking tests as fun because I didn't do it most of the time. Time. Um, we even, there was a local private Catholic school that my mother would let me take classes at, so I had peer group that was my own age occasionally that I got to interact with. I went to Girl Scout, so I had plenty of social interaction, though I will admit at the time I was better at interacting with adults and people of different ages uh, than people of my own. 
my brothers are actually 12 and nine years older than me. And we had the experience of, they would teach me. It was so wonderful to have this thing where my mother would teach me when she could, when she had time to, and sometimes she'd say, hey, your brothers are gonna teach you about really cool stuff. And so my, my brother, I remember my brother having this long conversation with me about negative integers, like boring concept in general, but my brother was really cool and I wanted to know what he knew about things. And so when he sat me down and talked about math and talked about negative integers, I, I just listened to him because he was cool and I wanted to listen to, I wanted to understand the things that he knew. And so that was my experience. My experience was constantly getting these opportunities to sit with adults and teenagers and, and people older than me and learn what they had to offer and what they were working on and kind of apprentice below them and, 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 and go, oh, I really don't want to do that job, but that was cool to learn for the day. Um, and then um, one of, the, one of the earliest things my mother did is I actually learned to read very young. I don't exactly know how young, but I have pictures of me at like two years old, like staring at books, so I have no idea if I was actually reading them or just going pictures. But um, I remember at one point, I'd, I'd learned to read and my mother sat me down and said, now you can learn anything, there is no excuse. Like, you can learn anything, you now know how to read. Now, like, go ahead and figure out what you wanna do, ask questions of people, but read about it. Like, anything that someone, someone says you can't know that, go, go read it, go find out. And um, the other huge aspect of what I think my mother raised me with that I, that I really cared a lot to, to share with other people is that my mother never said, what do you wanna be when you grow up? My mother always said, what problems do you want to solve? And so I spent my life looking at, ooh, like where are their problems and how do I solve them? And I've actually utilized that in my career um, and in adulthood. Um, the next thing was after a certain point, I'd been, I'd been homeschooled and unschooled, kind of controlling my own education, having my moments of, of sitting in, in, at a desk and kind of pretending I was in school, it was fun. Uh, at, when I was about 13 years old, my mother had an opportunity to take another job that meant she would have less time to actually uh, spend at home with me. And she said, what do you want to do next? Do you want to like go to high school? Do you want to go to college? You can do whatever you want. Like, you want to go to high school? Do you want to go to college? And I remember that it was a year after Columbine happened, the Columbine massacre in, in, uh, in the States. Um, so I was like, those high schoolers are crazy. I don't want to be anywhere near them. And so uh, I decided, I was like, hey, yeah, you know what? I want to go to college. College sounds like fun. And so mom said, all right, like, get into college. Here's your, here's your chance. Like, go learn about how to get into college and do it. And it was a fun little project yet again. Like, okay, cool. Like, I got to learn how to do this. And I got in, I was 14 years old when I went into my first college class. And, and, uh, and it was interesting because there I was, like, 14 years old, like, acne and like kind of greasy and kind of just like oh I don't like I'm not totally comfortable with myself because when you're a teenager you're not totally comfortable with like everything that's going on with puberty and, and just everything else and what was beautiful is instead of being in a high school where I'm surrounded by people my own age who are all going through this shitty experience together and 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 kind of like eating each other because they're trying to like climb up this like this ladder of social interaction where you're all kind of awkward and weird I had a bunch of college students who had already been through that, 18, 19, 20, up to, I had people in my class as old as 25, and they were all very sympathetic to like, oh, poor Robbins is just dealing with like the crappy puberty stage. And so I felt like love and, 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 and care and empathy from all these people that I was in class with. And we had these intellectual debates, we studied philosophy, and I took a lot of random classes. and. Um, and I, and I just got to know so many different people from so many different life points. And, um, and then when I finished school, it came down to what problems do I want to solve? And the first problem was, hey, I'm not really good at talking to people that don't, like, on a non-intellectual basis. So the first thing I did is I took a job in retail. <laughs> and my mother was like, why are you doing that? You are so much smarter than that. You could be doing anything. Why are you taking a retail job? And I was like, I need to get used to talking to people who don't know me, who I have no prior interaction with. I need to learn how to sell them things. I need to learn how to convince them that like what I'm saying is important and they need to purchase the item I'm, I'm selling them. And so I did that for a while. And then I went into 
other sales jobs. And eventually I went and worked for Peter Schiff as an investment, uh, working as an assistant to investment consultants. And then from that, I, I said, okay, what's the next problem I want to solve? We have this investment raise and I want to go, I want to help um, invest in this company, which later the, CEO, the CFO of that company said, you were so helpful. I'd like to give you a job. What job do you want? And so then I went and worked for this startup company, which I still work with today. And so I've had all these opportunities of going, what's the problem that needs solving? I'm going to solve it. I'm going to show whoever matters that I solved it. And, and I just seek reward from that. I get reward from that. And so it's been, it's been a tremendous experience of, I've never been limited by, you know, the instant, as you were, as Topher talked about, the institutionalization of things. I've never been limited by that. I don't, I don't give a shit what the rules are and what, what I'm supposed to be doing. I just say, hey, is that a problem? I need to fix that problem. Oh, are you supposed to be fixing that problem? How's that problem going? No, you haven't fixed it yet? Sorry, I'm gonna take your job right now. And, and I've done that a lot. And, and sometimes I, uh, I get clashes there, but, but I've certainly loved that, that, that my mother basically said, like, you can read, you can learn anything, find out what problems you want to solve, and take charge of your own education, you never stop learning. I was never particularly good at algebra or, like, or certain, certain tasks around that. I now run the accounting for a startup company, and I do like, all of their Excel spreadsheets, like massive amounts of Excel data. And I actually love it because I go, hey, I need to solve this problem. I need to solve this problem of how to keep track of all the money and the finances and create projections for a startup company. But I didn't learn that until the day I took the job. And I was like, all right, got to figure this out. And that's what I love is I never said, oh, I need to go to a class and learn that. I just need to figure out how to do it. And Google is really, really helpful nowadays. So um, the last thing I really want to bring up, and I think you, you really hit on a couple points I would have mentioned. So like. I think, I think of homeschooling and unschooling as just an, a tremendous way to uh, help children become better adults. <laughs> and um, the things that I love to mention, though, is that there are two people who speak prominently on, um, on unschooling and on peaceful parenting that, um, that I think anyone should go Google and check out their work. And their names are Dana Martin and Rosalind Ross. And so if you ever want to, if you're somebody considering homeschooling your children or unschooling your children, and you want to know more perspectives on that, especially from a libertarian perspective, I highly recommend Dana Martin and Rosalind Ross as people you should check out. Thank you. <laughs> These two guys have been communicating from their own story. An organisation called Praxis has really thought about that. This attitude of what do I want to create? What problem do I want to solve? They've thought about how do we systemise that? How do we actually make that something that people can do, even if they haven't been brought up like this from birth? And so Brad is the first Australian participant in the Praxis program. So it's really exciting to have him share a bit about that. But he's an interesting person because he's also studied teaching and worked in the teaching um, school sphere. And he's also really researched unschooling and come up with ways to try to help parents to do unschooling. So I'm really excited to hear from Brad. Thank you. Uh, so as Mark said, I'm a little bit different to the other guys. I was uh, fully schooled um, K through 12. Um, did a degree at Newcastle University, um, studied teaching and arts, not sure why they threw the arts degree and I didn't do any subjects that should result in that. Um, I was a Praxis participant, uh, as Mark also said, and um, since that I've just been kind of working with the partner business that I was working with, um, with Praxis, but I'll get to that in a sec. I'll start just with my uni experience. Um, I just found lectures at uni that were incredibly purposeless. Um, the tutorials, they were really just games. Um, some of it was, you know, what you'd use in the classroom, but overall, its, applic its applicability was very, very low. Um, I just found it very low value. You've probably noticed the same thing. Like, have you ever been sitting in university and thought, when am I ever going to learn this? Uh, when am I ever going to use this, sorry? And that was my entire degree. It was just garbage. Like, <laughs> we didn't even do essays. Like, everything was lesson plans, and it was all just this most contrived crap put into boxes to meet requirements. It was, it was just insane. 
But at that time, I had a very, uh, what I would call a schooled mindset. Um, I thought I needed a degree to be valuable. So I didn't drop out, and that was my first mistake. My second mistake was, I actually doubled down on that in uni. So I was unhappy at the time, and I thought what I need to do more is more uni, so I did honours. Um, and in the course of doing that, there was uh, the ethics kind of proposal for the research. Um, I didn't end up doing a research um, um, honours thesis, but we did talk a lot about the whole do no harm principle. And whenever I was in schools on my pracs or volunteering, um, I couldn't really reconcile that. Just didn't, school seemed like quite a harmful place to put children in terms of isolating them from the real world, putting them in front of a teacher that controls every aspect of their lives, as Mark said, to when they can go to the toilet, when they can get a drink of water. Um, and made them do dreary, boring work. Um, so in my year and a half as a teacher, through my internships, I probably spent about 250 days um, teaching uh, maybe 50 different classes because I was on casual, uh, six or seven different schools from you know, Sydney through to Newcastle. And I saw a lot of similar things, um, and I'd like to share with you a few stories, not kind of the classic horror stories, but just things that made me realise that school wasn't really uh, the best place that I think children should be. So there was one boy on my uh, first prac and um, they were doing dancing in the hall. And he came up to me and said, um, can I stop? And I said, sure, but can you tell me why? Like, what's going on? Is, are you sick? Is there a problem? He said, no, I just, I don't like dancing. It doesn't, it's not who I am. And I just thought, that's a really strange thing for a child to say, like this, articulating a concept of identity. And so I spoke to him about it, and he just said, you know, I don't feel comfortable dancing. And I thought, well, I don't feel comfortable dancing either, so I can't really force you to keep going. That just doesn't seem right. And you know, a teacher came over, what's going on? I just kind of covered for him, and the dancing was over, and they moved on. But it just made me think, this isn't forcing kids to participate, like the whole, um, not only is it compulsory attendance, but it's mandatory participation in every aspect of the lesson. And I just couldn't reconcile my personal values of, you know, freedom and connectedness and just treating people humanely with that. Um, there was another boy in a moderate um, autism, on the moderate autism spectrum, had a few other things in a special ed class. He was yelled at um, relentlessly for not doing a worksheet, uh, ended up in tears, thrown out of the room, well, dragged out of the room by his arm by the um, teaching assistant. He then tried to come back in, said he'd do the right thing. She dragged him back out, locked the door. He's still crying. And that just kind of broke me inside. Third one um, was a girl who was spoken of very poorly by her teacher. Um, she was on reading recovery. It's basically a government boondoggle where um, someone's brought in for a year to help teach them um, to do like focused individualized or small group reading with them. Um, basically the studies show that it works for a year. They, their um, reading level kind of increases. Then the year that that stops because it's only a one year program, their reading level goes back to where it was anyway. So totally pointless. Um, but that we, we had a free session in the afternoon, like a um, computer session or something. And I didn't advertise the fact that I played games. I didn't hide it. Um, she knew that I played Minecraft. Um, she started talking to me about this upcoming update where pistons were coming in. And we talked for an hour using vocabulary that, and concepts and ideas that I know that neither her reading recovery teacher or her main teacher would have had any concept or any idea that she would have um, understood that. Or just, just went to show that school subjects are a very narrow box. And people, if, you, if you're talking to someone about something that they're interested in, even if they're not showing academic skills, that they can articulate and convey really complex um, concepts. 
Um, but just in my short stint in schools, I just saw children humiliated, yelled into tears for speaking out of turn, their wills disregarded and dominated. And I just couldn't reconcile, as I said earlier, my personal values with just controlling and coercing them. Um, and then the whole intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, you know, bribing them, rewards, punishments, just wasn't into that. So um, after just seeing too many sad and frustrated faces, I um, decided that I needed to get out of uh, teaching. Just children aren't designed to learn this way. Um, and I'd seen better at democratic schools and free schools. Um, and knowing that something better was possible, I just couldn't continue doing that myself. And so while I was at uni, I'd heard of a program called uh, Praxis. I heard the founder, uh, Isaac Morehouse, talking about um, his idea and just completely fell in love with his vision. That was at our Foundation for Economic Education uh, talk. And I wanted something more. I wanted to learn you know, real skills that would actually be useful and valuable. Um, I mean, as far as I was concerned, uni wasted four years of my life and I just, I needed to fix myself basically. So I applied to Praxis and thankfully I was accept accepted. Um, basically what Praxis is, is an apprenticeship program for young entrepreneurial people. Uh, it's all about bridging the skills gap between what college kind of doesn't give you and um, be, being your own credential, so creating um, projects, working on things yourself, um, building, as um, Chris and Arvins and even uh, Mark talked about, just building your own portfolio, doing things, getting real hands on, real world experience. Um, so, in doing that, it's partly a pop portfolio of your own work. Um, and when you have that, it just becomes so much easier to find um, jobs, create your own jobs and really empower and just never again see yourself as a victim that, you know, sends resumes in and doesn't hear back. Um, in terms of the what, it is all about, as I said, building that personal brand, learning to pitch and sell yourself, um, learning by doing with a business partner. So that can be in sales, marketing or product development. Um, and basically they try to match you with where your interests are. So, um, oh, and there's also advisor sessions. So each week uh, might be a little less often now, but fairly often uh, you meet with somebody from Paraxis who's either gone through the program or done uh, a lot of their own kind of entrepreneurial activities themselves and they'll help advise you um, on kind of what you can do next. So in terms of what I got, got out of it, it was just a massive mindset shift. So I'll never have to worry about finding my own job because I know how to create a value proposition and sell myself and you know, reach out to businesses with my ideas and things that I've created or can create for them. Um, I'm part of a community. So a huge valuable element of Praxis is the community. Um, it's just high quality young people um, that are relentless sharers of valuable professional information and knowledge. So there's our uh, sales groups, there's marketing groups, and just general personal development um, groups with constant discussions and information being shared that they're learning and that they're getting from other sources. Um, another thing I've got, um, a co-founder. So as Mark mentioned, um, just started uh, Unschool HQ with a Praxis participant, Caitlin, um, and she is an unschooler herself. She's 16, um, was recently taken on as an intern at the where I worked for um, Praxis, so my business partner. Um, and we, that business partner does kind of marketing for accountants. Um, and basically I just, I got the skills that I wanted to get in digital marketing and continue to work on kind of HQ and build my brand. And that's what I'm going to keep, keep on doing. Thank you. We're a little bit squished up here. We have another panelist. We have Nicola Wright is a homeschool or an unschooling mum herself from Western Australia. And some of you in your questions, I've seen some of them already coming through, are kind of newbie questions. 
and you might want to hear from people that are doing it. And so it's it's um, a pleasure to welcome up Nicola, who can tell you a bit about herself and what she does. So I've been unschooling my two kids since 2008. Um, I've got a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. Um, and my eldest child went to kindy for a year, and then he started um, at pre-primary. And um, so at pre-primary, I pulled him out of, out of there for reasons much like what Brad was describing. I kind of helped out in the class, and I just, just the whole environment just wasn't gelling with um, my gut feelings about what I should be doing for my five-year-old child. Um, so we I had a few friends homeschooling, so that made it easier. So with deliberation with my husband, we pulled him out um, and started homeschooling from there. And it very quickly devolved into unschooling, which is, if you haven't heard of that before, it's a much more unstructured. So you can have homeschoolers who do school at home, um, and unschooling is a little bit more where well, you're following a child's interests and facilitating uh, things for them that they're interested in and also putting things in front of them that they might not know that they're interested in. Um, so I get asked a lot why <coughs> am I homeschooling and there's two main reasons and the first reason was basically freedom and the sense that um, just that coercive environment wasn't best for my kids. I didn't know how long we would do it for but we just started and we're still doing it. Um, and the second reason that sort of slowly started dawning on me as the kids got older was um, is that there's kind of this whole paradigm about learning from different from at school. So at school you need to, they tell you you need to learn certain things that you're going to need later in life. Um, but I'm sort of starting to believe, um, and it's become evident to me, that you learn things as required. Um, and even as adults, we do that all the time. We're life learning constantly. And um, so I believe that with kids too. So where they want to go and what futures they want to have, they, they can find out what they need to know at the time. And that's when you're most intrinsically motivated um, to learn anything, whether it be math or anything at all. So in the internet age, information is freely available. We don't need gatekeepers as we used to in the past where um, schools and universities held the information and you had to go to them to learn it. So it's kind of opened up the world and I think that's going to be the future. Um, this might seem like a bit of a contradiction but my 14 year old has just started at a community high school this term. But it's a voluntary kind of decision we made together. So. Um, I was thinking I wasn't showing him enough or giving him enough experiences. Um, so we're trying this out, but we're doing it in an unschooling fashion. So, you know, if it doesn't work out for him at the end of the term and he's not happy, then we'll rethink it. It's not, it's not something that he has to do. So, so I'm still learning because I went through the school system. Um, so a lot of homeschooling parents talk about unschooling themselves. And it's just constantly questioning your preconceptions about education and what that means. Um, so if you're thinking about doing it, obviously, the biggest kind of factor is how you can afford to do it as a family, because it, it's a sacrifice that the mum makes or the dad, but mostly it's the mum. And the dad, too, has to keep providing, or if you're a single parent, you're going to have to start juggling things. But from the whole time I was unschooling, I managed to do a degree, start a business, and also I'm employed doing digital communications from home. So it's possible, you just have to get creative. And the good thing about that is you're also setting an example for your kids too, showing them. Um, they're just in an, in an environment where they see adults doing things. And, and that's basically it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. I just wanted to share a few things as well myself. I'm a university lecturer, but I've also got six kids and we homeschool them. And my oldest has started university this year. Did last year a certificate four in liberal arts with Augustine Academy. My second oldest is doing that this year. Um, 
But some really exciting things have happened just in the last few years. The Gillard government brought in the system where universities can basically take anybody they want. There's no quotas. And from a fiscal point of view, that's just a stupid idea. It's a blank check um, to universities. But for homeschoolers, thinking selfishly for ourselves, it's actually been excellent. Because universities have become basically just marketing machines. They're out there trying to round up anybody with a pulse, right? To, to get them in the door, because that means more subsidy to themselves. Um, which means a few things. It means for those people who think that the university is just part of this escalator that they're on all of their life, right? You just do what you're told. You go to kindergarten, you go to primary school, you go to high school, you go to university, and that gets you a job, that gets you a higher paying job and a better status, and that gets you retirement. And it's all just this, they're finding that it actually doesn't do that, right? It's the, the escalator system, like Brad was talking about, if you just see that as um, the next thing that I'm supposed to do because I was told, you'll find that it doesn't work because 20 million other people have been told the same thing, right? And we can't have 20 million people all doing the same thing. You need to innovate. You need to think differently. So it means that the quality of university might not quite be as good or the, um, what a, a university degree buys you in the workplace. And so it means that some employers are starting to say, we don't really care about your certificate anymore. We, want, we care about what you can do for us. Show us. You demonstrate what you can do and what you know. Don't just show us the bit of paper and assume that that communicates everything that we want to hear. <laughs> right? But for homeschoolers, it's actually very good. Because if you do know what you want to do, and you know that some form of higher education is an important part of that, and it often is, right? There are things that we do need higher education for, speaking as a person in the university sector. Sometimes it is very good. If you know what you want to do, uh, and you're willing to just go and do it, home education is excellent preparation for that. So homeschool kids that come through into the universities thrive. They do really well because they're already in the mindset of, I need to take control of my own learning. I need to be self-directed, and that sort of thing. Um, so those changes have actually been good. And, and universities, the other thing that that, that, that um, policy decision has done, it's sort of set universities and schools up as competitors. It, there used to be this happy handover, right? The schools, the, the high school owns you until a certain age, and then the higher education sector owns you. Um, now, They'll take anybody. They don't mind poaching the school system. So it used to be, um, you know, five plus years ago, it's pretty recent, that people would homeschool up until about 10th grade and then go into the school system for year 11 and 12 in order to get into university, if that's what they wanted to do, because that was the main pathway. Now it's turning the opposite way. People are realising, I can just drop out of, of high school and go straight into university through other methods. And universities have their own tertiary, tertiary enabling programs and things like that. And the kids that do those tertiary preparation programs or enabling programs are actually much better prepared than the kids who've been through year 11 and 12, being told, you know, with the bell ringing all the time and being told what to do. Um, those tertiary enabling programs are actually pretty good. Um, or there are other methods of getting into university, like doing open university, Huge numbers of people do open university and most of them never complete it, right? Because it's something that anyone can just sign up to and pay your fee. Uh, because most people think, oh, that sounds like a good idea until they actually get the work and go, oh, that's really boring or I don't know what to do. Or, and so it's great for the universities getting free money, <laughs> right? But it doesn't work for most people, but works really well for homeschoolers who, that's how the, who know what they want to do and know how to learn under the situation <coughs> where they've got to be self-directed. And there's another way into university. So we homeschoolers sort of help each other with tips and tricks. University recruiters want people. They don't necessarily know that this homeschool market is out there. Um, and so we help each other to sort of navigate this. Now we're going to... Um, Open it up for questions. So um, I know I, I actually, since I grew up with another a number of other homeschoolers around me, I actually saw a bunch of different family units do it. And so I actually I knew of a family like 
traditional mother, father, Mary, and I think the father was working, the mother wasn't. Um, but uh, she was homeschooling her child, and it basically, at 16 years old, she basically told her child to like go on and get a job and do something useful. And so that that 16 year old. Uh, came and actually lived with my family and helped my parents homeschool at the time in which my brothers were 12 and 9 and I was being born and so my basically my family was like wow we're about to be outnumbered by our kids we have to raise we have the, the, the 12 year old and the 9 year old we're still homeschooling them and on top of that we now have an infant we'd like a nanny for and so it was interesting because we were able to actually they were able to offer a job and continued education to a homeschooled kid who needed, who, who wanted to kind of do something useful and get out of her parents' house. And, uh, and so there are ways to do things like that. I know my parents, at the time my brothers were being homeschooled, they were, uh, it was a two-parent household, and, um, and my parents were both working on, on higher education. And so at different times, my mother was working and my father was the one that stayed home with the kids. And then, uh, and they did a switch back after, uh, after she, I think she finished like both her degree in school and and, and work at the same time. Uh, but my parents divorced when I was seven, and so that's when my mother was like, "Oh goodness, can I actually homeschool while a single mother with a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old and a six-year-old or seven-year-old?" And um, and that was definitely something that my mother worried about. And so one of the things she had done was she connected with a local private school in order to make sure she could supplement my education if there were times that she couldn't be there for me. But what she found is that she had a number of friends who were retired, who were otherwise around and capable of helping be there for me when I'm seven years old, they can't exactly be left home alone. Uh, or when I when you know I had a 17 year old older brother who would be happy to kind of hang out with me for the day and and bring me along on whatever fun things he was doing and so we were able to kind of every day was a new adventure because there were different things happening different people in my life who kind of came together so I had a community of people I had a nanny I had I had my my brothers I had my mother's friends who all came together to say we're going to help educate Ovens in the way in, in, in and help her learn what she wants to learn and give her you know options within an environment like today you're going to have to hang out with this person because mom has to work and so it's entirely possible to homeschool children or unschool children without having to do the traditional like two parents and one of them has to give up their career in order to do it. So just so you know, there are definitely options and being creative about how you do it is, is actually a, a great a element of unschooling and homeschooling. So. Can I make a comment on that as well? Um, similar to Arvin's, um, my family were, were kind of part of a much larger homeschooling group. Uh, and so I got to see some kids get homeschooled really badly. Uh, I was lucky that my parents, uh, in my view, did a really excellent job of it. And, and I think, broadly speaking, the difference between the two, as, as I alluded to earlier, the difference between, between the two, bad homeschooling makes a child's world smaller. Good homeschooling makes a child's world bigger. And that, broadly speaking, that's the difference. If you are a single parent, it is going to be more challenging. Um, I would describe homeschooling as a lifestyle choice that impacts the entire family. You have to change not just, it doesn't just change the way the child is educated, it changes the way the entire family lives. Community is crucial if you want to be a homeschooling family. I would argue that community is crucial regardless of how your kids get schooled. So if you don't have a community, that's a problem no matter how your, your children are being schooled, but it becomes doubly so uh, if you're homeschooling. So, your circumstances may be very, very challenging. It comes down to whether you're willing to make the sacrifices in other areas and manage the logistics to make it work in your circumstances. I just wanted to ask um, Nicola to come up on the stage as well to help answer questions. And um, starting with this next one from James Reed. Oh, it's just refreshed and it's gone up the page. Thanks to everybody that's commented since. Here it is. What barriers are in place, what regulations, etc., and are things in this area getting better or worse? Yeah. Could you help answer that one? Yeah. Really, I can only talk about WA. Okay. Um, so, depending on what state you are in, there's different regulations. Is this um, on? No. Hold it closer. Hold it closer. Better? Yeah. 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 Um, so, depending on what state you are in, um, the regulations are either really quite onerous or they're pretty lax. Um, in WA, we see um, a homeschool moderator once a year, and basically they're just coming out to make sure you're not 
being one of these dysfunctional families and neglecting your kids, um, and that you have a basic a basic plan. Um, so we're all given the Australian curriculum, which is a pretty loose document of waffle and garbage. And you then <laughs> make what you are doing fit that. Well, that's what I do anyway. And so over the course of a year, just living an unschooling life, you find that you're actually covering quite a bit of material. Um, once you put it into a report, which is what I do, just to kind of keep my distance and keep them off my back. Um, yeah, so it's just a hoop jumping exercise, basically, but we do have the freedom in WA to be pretty flexible at this stage. But I have heard that yeah, I might just comment on that too, that the, the states inter, like they basically take it in turns to try to do a crackdown. <coughs> New South Wales did about five years ago. Um, it's Victoria's turn at the moment. I've put a, um, a petition on the ALS um, forum group on Facebook, if you wouldn't mind having a look at that. But the Victorian government at the moment, actually Victoria has the, 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 the most easygoing um, laws for registering as a homeschooler. But, you know, there's, as the socialist state of Victoria at the moment, they're trying to, to clamp down. Um, the trouble is, you're basically being regulated by your competitor. Uh, the people who come to regulate homeschool are basically the, person, the, the, the same department who sees it as leakage if anybody leaves the school system. This is the problem, right? It's like all restaurants being um, um, health inspected by McDonald's, say. Um, they've got an agenda, and, and, and they just don't necessarily get homeschooling. Some on the ground level do, but a lot don't. So they come from the mentality of, show me that this isn't any different to school. Yeah. Um, and homeschoolers are like, if it wasn't any different, why would we be doing it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? We fuck with US regulations a lot. And you do with that same sort of thing? Do you want yeah. to just comment on that? So in the U.S., which I know isn't as relevant to the rest of you, but every state in the U.S. has a different form of, of, of regulating homeschooling. Some school, some states have very little regulation whatsoever. Just all you have to do is say I'm homeschooling my kids. Uh, and in other states, it's actually more of a regulation. Uh, at the time that I was born, my parents were in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania had a very interesting uh, form of you simply had to. Uh, provide logs about your homeschooling education. And so you had to say, oh, my kids are learning science, oh, my kids are learning math, oh, they did two hours here, they did three hours there, blah, blah, blah. And so my parents actually, um, my mother would just get the notebook out at the beginning of the day, and she'd literally just put uh, notes like, okay, today we made breakfast. Breakfast is science. <laughs> and so, you know, you're putting things, you're mixing things together, and how, you know, what, for, what, uh, what, how many cups of this, and blah, blah, blah. And so she would, she she would basically turn uh, daily activities into things that we could call science, or we could call math, or we'd go grocery shopping, and we'd have to we'd have to uh, go through the receipt. That was math class, and so it was interesting because we found different ways to kind of mess with that. Because at the end of the day, the, the in in the U.S. there are definitely hoops to get jumped through. But some of them, like in Pennsylvania at the time, uh, were simply things like, okay, I just have to fill out a booklet and say, yep, my kids can do this. Certain states, I think, actually require that uh, the homeschooled children go through standardized testing. I did not have that experience myself. Uh, but there's also a number of, uh, of schools uh, uh, private schools in the U.S. that allow homeschoolers to bring in, uh, to, to basically submit information and then say, oh yeah, I did all this stuff and they give me a, a, a high school diploma. So I actually have a high school diploma that I never set foot in that school whatsoever. I just paid them $500 and said, here, look, I know how to do all these things equivalent to a high schooler, and they gave me a diploma <laughs> at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Do we need to finish up? How are we? Uh, yeah, we're out of time. It's been one more question. All right, I did have one planned just in case I got the opportunity. Do you need to have academic type parents um, to homeschool? Um, what if you What if you don't have that much education yourself as a parent? Can you do it? Anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, there's this thing called Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, in all seriousness, absolutely not. Um, in many respects, when my parents started homeschooling my older brothers, they would take a very academic approach to it. They had textbooks out of high schools from around Australia. They were studying them, picking the best ones, all that sort of thing. 
as time went on, we headed more and more towards the unschooling model. And by the time I was finishing up, we had zero focus on what I knew and complete focus on who I was. That was, that was the academics had gone completely out the window. Um, so no, I would say if anything, worrying about the academic side of things is likely to do more damage to your preparation of your child for adulthood, because remember that's the focus, than, than actually ticking all the academic boxes would. Yeah. <coughs> um, and one misconception is that parents have to do all the teaching themselves, which isn't true. Uh, we've accessed heaps of like, external classes that are offered. Um, in WA there's quite a big homeschooling community and there's cooperatives um, and we get um, yeah, science teachers or, or whatever. To come. So it's not just me doing it. But at a primary school level, I mean it's really like Tosha said, there's Google. Mm -hmm. And you need, you need basically as parents to be role models rather than the, the, a library <coughs> and a, you know, the ultimate source of information. Um, school kids are taught that all of the information already exists and it's in this big um, you know, glob and you need to just tap into that and it'll trickle down to you. As homeschoolers, we don't take that mentality. You need to role model inquisitiveness. <coughs> There's a thing that I'd like to know or to be able to do or to be able to create. How would I go about that? And the, parent, the children see the parents themselves figure things out and they go, oh, so that's what I'm supposed to do, figure things out. That exactly, I think, is, is um, like my mother's a very academic person. My mother is terrible at math. Like, I'm sorry, my mother is not a good math person. And so I understood my mother is not the person to go to to get a math education. Thankfully, she had a friend who taught like SAT courses and stuff, and she had me like sit with them sometimes. But the fact is, what I loved about unschooling and homeschooling is that um, I learned that my parent, like, when, when the school, when a when a student is in school, they often look to the teacher and the teacher has to know all the right answers. The teacher is that person who knows the answers. And I knew my parents had a lot of knowledge in a lot of subjects and they didn't have knowledge in certain subjects. And there were people that we were referred to because there was a division of labor. There was a division of, hey, these are the people that know these things and these people know these things. And so you have to get your knowledge from multiple sources. And, and sometimes those sources will actually argue with one another. And that was extremely valuable in and of itself to be able to go, oh, like there isn't just one source of information. All of these sources of information exist. Mm. Well, I've had a lot of fun. I hope you have too. Let's just thank all of our panelists this afternoon. Thank you.